Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. Hey, thanks for joining us for this edition of Donnybrook. Great to have you with us and a lot of hot topics in this mid-July edition. Uh, but after that, we're going to talk to two individuals who think that making a walkable, bikeable St. Louis will really yield economic development. We'll talk to Cindy Mency of TrailNet and Sarah Arnosky, Vice President at Greater St. Louis, Inc. But first, let's discuss the issues with our panel. Let's meet them. Wendy Weiss is the news director for the Big 550 KTRS. She's also the co-host of the Jennifer and Wendy Show. Mr. Bill McClellan is with us, a founder of the program. Peace to you, too. And he's with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Ray Hartman with RawStory.com, the Big 550, KTRS, and the Riverfront Times, another founder. And he's the news editor and sports columnist with the St. Louis American, Alvin Reed, joining the panel. Okay, let me ask you, Ray Hartman, uh, it was kind of uh, historic, I guess. People said that with the 10 or was it 12 hour meeting this week of the St. Louis Board of Aldermen, they shattered all records for this legislative body had never met uh, at, at quite such a length. Uh, I guess historians will have to look into that and see if that's true. But nonetheless, this year, St. Louis is getting 498 million federal dollars for the American Rescue Plan. And uh, a lot of that has been allocated thanks to action by the board. Direct payments of $500 will go to 10,000 needy St. Louisans. Gift cards will go to St. Louisans so they'll be vaccinated. The police will get $5 million in overtime. And all of this goes to the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, which meets Friday, tomorrow. So there's another step before this becomes reality. But overall, what did you think? I think that a lot of people are cynical about the city of St. Louis, and I only wish that Washington would work as well as the city of St. Louis did. I mean, you had differences of opinion between Mayor Tashar Jones and Louis Reed, the aldermanic president. They sat down and apparently they hashed it out. I, you know, and again, I guess it's easy to sit here and just say, I like all of the above, but I do. I think that they, they compromised and, um, that's what we want public officials to do is talk things out and compromise. And I happen to think that the uh, that while it's unconventional, the direct payments will be stimulative to the St. Louis economy and more important, help the people that uh, is it 10,000 people that will be receiving them. Um, and um, they'll be very helpful, very critical to those folks. And um, I, I think it's a good step. I think they're they're working in the right direction. Uh, while I agreed with him, I'm going to go way back when this first all came up and Bill McClellan said, like, why not just take the $5 million out of the stimulus package? Um, so it's it's kind of, you know, maybe it didn't, didn't need to take six hours and maybe some of the solutions were right there. So maybe this was a little too much political dogfight, um, but it's called compromise. And like Ray said, that's that's, I think, all that most of America wants right now and if both teams could say like hey i got a win out of this that's not a bad thing that's not a bad thing at all so hey if you're going to get the job done get the job done well hey, I'm, Jeffrey I'm, Boyd, I'm, I'm sorry bill go it. ahead go ahead bill well i was gonna say i'm happy with it too but it's going to be interesting to figure out what ten thousand people get five hundred dollars because there's an awful lot of people who could use $500? I mean, do you go, give it to the poorest people or does it have to be somebody who was impacted directly by COVID, you know, someone who lost their job? I mean, I, and I don't know the details of that, but it'll be interesting. Certainly broadcasters should be first we've in line. Had the, we've had stimulus checks from President Bush, President Trump, President Biden because of, of COVID. Uh, Jeffrey Boyd and Lewis Reed were certainly not in favor of it just on its merits because th they're saying that it's, 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 you can't prove 
that it's going to make that much of a difference and that it was just good money after bad or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm trying to figure out is Mayor Jones said that this will address the crime issue at or the root cause of the crime issue in the city and it will keep people in their homes. And I think that's an awful lot to expect of a $500 check. I, I don't, I honestly don't see how $500 addresses the root causes of crime in our, in our city. Oh, no, well, that's, that's, that's political talk. It addresses right. Now it may be one gazillion of, you know, uh, impact, but, it, but yeah. it could, could it, it could probably will make some impact. So I mean, I'm well, not saying it's going to solve. Well, oh, and I think I think I, I, I think it makes the politicians popular when they hand out money. There's no doubt, and that's why there was an interesting caveat to this measure, and that was that no name, image, or likeness of any politician could be attached to those $500 checks or to the gift cards. Now, I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, don't get me wrong. A lot of people could use that money, but there's also a ton of litter out there, and. In the 1930s, we had the Works Progress Administration. I would have liked to have seen some sort of group of people getting paid $500 to clean up some of our highways and byways in the city of St. Louis. They, well, let me point out, they do have, and I don't know what it is, but they have a fairly specific plan. And I, as Bill says, it'll be interesting to see how it is in practice, but it's not like they're just saying, which I think it's families, and I, I, they have a bunch of criteria. So my point is they got a plan. We'll have to see if it works. I think it does matter, and I think that poverty is one of the um, indicators of crime. Well, let's face it; I mean, it's, it's fair. okay. And the extent but, some people are able, five hundred may not seem like a lot to everybody, but it might be the difference between. But in, in the interest of time, in we, we read in the paper today, Bill McClellan, that there are eight hundred jobs in the uh, city of St. Louis that are not filled, and this was a story taking a look at how because they can't find people to work as trash haulers, the city is no longer separating the recycled material from the trash. It's all being collected together, at least temporarily. Who knows how long this is gonna last? But one of the reasons is they can't find trash haulers. There's about 30 openings there, but overall in the city, 800 job openings. And it is kind of unusual, isn't it, to be handing out checks to people who can't find work while the city itself has 800 jobs available. Well, it was a, a very interesting story because I, I, I would think that, you know, the police department might have trouble finding eligible city dwellers because they might have records or something. But you wouldn't have that problem with trash haulers. And I think there's a lot of people who would really like a steady job with benefits. And it's incredible to me that we haven't that the city has not been able to fill those jobs. And Heather Navarro, the 28th Ward Alderman, said that she went online to see how easy it is to apply for a job, and she couldn't do it. And they quoted somebody saying, well, the system was for, is from 1968. And I remember 1968, and I got ties from 1968, <laughs> but you don't want to have a computer system from 1968. So I think the city ought to really make an effort to hire people and give them honest work. And I'm, I'm sure that there's plenty of people who would want the trash hauling jobs and some of the other 800 jobs. It's I'm not, I'm not sure that it's, it's a matter of the city not trying. I, I think, you know, when you talk about trash haulers, uh, and we're talking about police officers and how far down we are on that score and 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 the IT needs of the city uh, it, there there are as, as as Charlie said as you've all agreed there are almost 1000 positions open in the city and they people obviously don't want that kind of work well, I, can, I, can, I can see IT. I can see a shortage of IT workers because maybe an IT worker could make more in private industry. And, I, and like I said, I can see the problem with the police department, but I don't see the problem hiring uh, trash haulers. They, they don't want to. Not but, a but, bad but, job, Wendy. Well, right, uh, no, I, Linda I, Thomas from the personnel department uh, in the post dispatch a couple weeks ago said that because of federal benefits, they're coming from Washington, D.C. People are not as motivated to apply for some of these jobs. And I believe she made her comments 
in a post-dispatch story when it was described how they couldn't find 9-11 uh, dispatchers. Well, but, but they've had this problem long before the pandemic, long before the government was giving $300 a week extra on unemployment. You know, the 9-11 stuff, that went south as soon as the city got control of the police department. You know, they, they suddenly stripped a lot of 9-11 workers, and, I, and I'm sure we've been short garbage haulers for, for a long time as well. Well, I think one thing, if, if you if you waive the drug test for a lot of jobs, mm -hmm. a lot more people would apply. Now, that's just a reality. That's good. It. And then, two, I wanted to be a journalist since I was 12, but the first job, and my mom, my mom, as my witness, five-year-old Alvin thought the coolest thing in the world would be to be a garbage man. Mm -hmm. And I know they're sanitation workers now, but that's how we do them, because they got to ride on the back of the truck, okay? Now... Times have changed, but I'm kind of like Bill. Good paying job with benefits? I, I kind of don't understand why people are hesitant to, you know, like fulfill some of these jobs. I mean, I I, I don't I don't get it. I don't well, we, the computer we've system all goes seen, back we've to all seen, We've all seen the online reports of people saying that they're giving up their they're giving up their white collar jobs. They're giving up their corporate jobs because they don't want to deal with the adversity in the workplace. And mm -hmm. I mean, those are those are actual terms that are being thrown around. Adversity in the workplace. I mean, that's to me, that's part of going to work. There's going to be adversity. <laughs> you're, you know, you're you're paid to do a job. So well, I, I hey, it doesn't seem well, to be an appetite for it. While, while we're talking about the city and we will move on to other regional issues in just a moment, Alvin Reed, uh, this past week, Mayor Tashara Jones and Congressman Cory Bush visited Denver to take a look at the STAR program there. STAR stands for Support Team Assistance Response, a program that sends um, social workers to some, uh, I guess, to, to some sites that ordinarily would have been visited by police. In this case, it's trespassing or welfare issues, or it could be a, a syringe found on the street, things like that. Not the most serious crimes. Mayor Lida Krusen had two pilot programs along these lines. Let me ask you, do you think that this trip will bear fruit? I think it could. I think you go for what what's the successful practices, and you go and you find out what they're doing. And... That's one of the things that the mayor, uh, Cory Bush, and a lot of politicians that, you know, Republican or Democratic, actually kind of adhere to that maybe we don't need to send the police to, to every situation. And to find out the best way to do it on a trip to Denver, I mean, even if they, you know, were, you know were overnight, I, um, I really don't think that's setting the whole, you know, budget back that much. Now, I don't hold me to this, but I believe there may have been some trips involved to China and places like that during previous administrations. Um, you know, when we we're going to be the the trade partner with China and China Hub. You know, the, yeah, exactly. And you know, where'd that go? And where did a lot of projects where I'm sure a lot of visiting, you know, went on that were much, much more costly than an overnight trip to Denver? I, I don't even think it's. Go ahead, Ray. I'm sorry. No, no, you go ahead. I don't think it's a matter of money. I just think it's I think it's the apples oranges comparison. St. Louis is in the middle of a crisis in terms of of crime and homicide numbers, and Denver is not on any of the FBI's most dangerous cities list. So I I, I could care less what it costs to go out there. I just I I don't know that it's an applicable. The Star program is applicable to what we're dealing with here in St. Louis. I'm sure they got plenty of crime in Denver. I mean, and and they've got. If it's a best practices thing, I mean, you can argue that some of it's symbolic when political figures go to these things. But and, and frankly, I don't think you should always rule out uh, trade mission stuff because sometimes that actually, as far fetched as it may seem, sometimes you have to have your chief executives, whether it's a governor or mayor, or whatever, show up and talk to trade delegations. I mean, that's what they do, right? You can argue just because it sounds like an exotic trip doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't do it. I mean, because if other cities have people going, their mayor's going, they can make a difference. You, you have to pitch. That's part of 
That's great. If we're going to all be in, if government's going to be in the economic development business, you can't say, oh, no, we can't go overseas because of the, the cost of the trip. I mean, you just can't. And a lot of times those are, uh, sometimes those trips can be subsidized by private private sectors and folks too. So I don't, I don't think, you, and I have no, like Alan, Alvin said, this is hardly a, a major trip. I think symbolically it makes sense. I need to go to San Francisco and visit their PBS station. So Charlie, let's work that out. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Alvin, I think we'd have a good time at the Denver PBS station. <laughs> If you follow up my direction. I would, I would take it in. <laughs> I, I, I think it's great that they're learning best practices, and I don't think the cost matters at all. But I think, Wendy, you do have a point. Last year, Denver had about 90 homicides. Denver's population is 700,000. On a typical year, Denver has about uh, 60 homicides per year. So it is kind of apples and oranges because we had 260 homicides. So we're, you know, we're dealing with real violent crime that Denver doesn't see. And... The STAR program had about 1,300 responses last year, which, wow, that's a fraction of, uh, you know, the calls that police in, at the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department have to respond to. If you're, one, if you're going for best practices, would you want somebody that's having better outcomes? I mean, I don't, I don't think that the idea that Denver is someplace where, you know, it's, I mean, I've been to Denver's great. It's that it's, there's all kinds of yeah. factors that go into crime rates, but the fact that they have a lower one is an argument to go, not one not to go. Well, I, I think we well, they have 700,000 people. We have 300,000 in our city. So what? I mean, it, it's not apples and oranges. I don't well, agree. But correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't there a guy by, by the name of Will Pinckney with the mayor's office? Uh, he, he launched this program a couple of times in St. Louis. Um, and uh, he's a former New York uh, cop who I think was profiled in one of the local papers recently, if I'm not mistaken. So, hey, let's uh, talk to you, Wendy, about what I think is a truly unprecedented story. This is uh, a battle between the Natural Resources Defense Council and Spire. Spire has a subsidiary that runs a pipeline between here and it goes through Illinois up north to get some of that fracking natural gas. And uh, that Spire pipeline was reviewed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and approved. However, just recently, the Washington, D.C. Court of Appeals decided to revoke the certification for that pipeline, saying that FERC, the regulatory body, did not follow its own rules. And as a result, Bryce Gray has the story in Sunday's Post-Dispatch that this pipeline, bringing natural gas to St. Louis, might be mothballed, and they're even talking about filling it with sand because imploding it would be another environmental disaster. So how do you feel? Do you think that since the uh, regulatory body violated its own rules, allegedly, that the the pipeline should be taken down? Well, then, I mean, shame on the regulatory body then, but you don't penalize the natural gas customers here in the Midwest. Uh, the, whole, the whole point was to avoid a situation, or they ha had avoided a situation similar to what we saw in Texas in February during a deep freeze in which people lost their lives. Uh, people were, for a variety of different reasons and things that they had signed up for in terms of budget billing, they were they were receiving twelve and fifteen thousand dollar utility bills. Um, and, and I, I'm, I'm sorry that that some of the the market analysis that should have been performed wasn't performed. But that's not in in my way of looking at things. That's not on Spire. That's on FERC. Well, that's. I mean, it's a the court. This isn't some like liberal think tank that made this decision. It's the court of appeals. Okay, these are judges looking at the law as to how. And obviously, they're reviewing if they're appeal, appellate judges. They, I don't know what which side appealed. So, I, but I, they looked at the law as it was applied by lower court judges and made a decision. You say shame on them if they didn't do it right. Then the judges are saying you got to do it right. I mean, it's not like they did. There's some wrongdoing by the appellate this court. Is, I think this is intended to have a chilling impact on anybody who wants to invest in pipelines. Period. Intended Period. to the law, Wendy. I mean, these are judges. The appellate court has got to be reviewing, by definition, a lower court that found that the regulators, and, and it's not exactly a newsflash that in the Trump era, the regulators 
or just looking the other way, they're saying you can't do that. And and so I don't understand what the argument is with, is the argument that the judges should look the other way too? I mean, it's, it's they just imply, enforce the law. It's done. And, it's it's done. The pipeline. I mean, it's it's completed. It's delivering natural gas. Well, again, but, they followed the law, and if if the regulators didn't, then it's the right decision. And, and we we can't have every decision come down to well, okay. you know, it's it's better for our economy. So there is uh, the environmental concerns are there for a reason. And if they didn't follow the rules, mm. then this is the right decision. Well, Ray, and politics speak. doesn't play into this at all, right, Ray? This is purely with a, legal. With the Court of Appeals? I don't think so. I mean, maybe okay. it did. I okay. mean, I, I don't know. But again, the Court of Appeals, which is, you know, not yeah. really well, known as being all that liberal, let me is just jump doing in. a lower court's decision about whether the law was followed. If it wasn't, then you got to either follow the law or dump sand in it, I guess. Well, uh, Truly unprecedented. I've never heard of a, a gas pipeline being mothballed, but we'll see what happens, Ray, while we have you uh, front and center. Let me ask you about uh, the sentence this past week of Randy Hayes. Of course, he's the former St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department officer who pleaded guilty in the beating of his colleague, the undercover police officer, Luther Hall. And uh, Mr. Hayes received four years, a just sentence. Well, it goes by, a, it's a federal Okay, so it goes by the point system, and and there's points added for you know cooperation. There's points taken away for this, and points added to that. They start with a range, and you know there's not that much subjectivity. There's some, but you know the judge. I, I have to say I was surprised by it. I thought it was more than I thought he would get. I would be concerned if I was uh, Dustin Boone who basically was tried for the same, if, if the paper had it right, pretty much pri tried on the same charges that Mr. Hayes was just sentenced and he cooperated. I would be, I wouldn't be sleeping too well if I was, you know, had just gone through a jury trial and been found guilty of those charges. Mm -hmm. But again, I, once again, you don't know where Boone versus Hayes are on the sentencing guidelines. It's a lot of it is not subjective i mean some of it is but they've got a range and he stayed within the range the well, prosecutors wanted six again i was surprised by it okay but okay how about you bill mcclellan well, well i i thought you know the subjective part i i, I don't it, it, the whole point of getting people to to testify is you're going to give them a break on the sentencing especially in a case like this where it's a cop testifying against other cops and i hate to see the guy who testified getting more time than the people who went to trial i, I mean if if what we want in the future is other cops to testify about bad conduct of their colleagues this isn't a very good way to do it i feel if, if a judge goes above or below the, the way i understand it mm. particularly above it you and I, I agree with you basically i mean sure you would expect that's why i say i would think mr boone is got to be concerned mm. about that perhaps although i don't know if it works that way it is the point system it is the guidelines well judge violate uh, i'm sorry but, but, but they can go above and below right i mean if they, if they know, there, do there's some discretion that, and, and that, i'm, I'm just do, surprised not, not only can they go above or below but like john rollo if later uh, Randy Hayes pr says that he's got some sort of illness. Who knows if he'll get out or if he goes through some sort of rehab program as Steve Stenger did, maybe he'll be out in two years. If they, I'm not even defending the judge. I'm saying if they do, they are more subject to okay. getting overturned on appeal. That's the, and a lot of judges don't want to have that happen to them. Speaking, I, of, I, the, I, okay. I just, uh, speaking of the courts, Bill, Eugene Ferencrog Jr., unleashed an expletive in St. Louis County Court. This is in front of Circuit Court Judge John Barbonis, and it was basically expletive you. The judge gave this attorney a week in jail for cursing at him. What do you think? Well, I, I, I don't know e either of those fellows, and I, I called up a good friend of mine, and he didn't know the, a lawyer, and he didn't know the judge, but he knew the uh, cursor, and he said that, you know, he's like 75 years old, you know, a young man in, in his prime, <laughs> and, and, and he, he said that he's a good fellow, and he said, I'd really like to know what 
was behind this. But, but as far as the judge putting the guy in jail, I, I think that there should be decorum in court. And like I think a judge, you know, ought to be able to say to somebody, I, I don't like the way you're dressed. That's not respectful to the court. And if somebody curses at a judge, I think the judge is well within his or her rights to say, I'm not going to tolerate that and, and to throw a guy in jail. I don't have a problem with that. Well, I just think a week is too much. Now, if he just told him, hey, you know, go to Hades, do you get like one day? Uh, if you told him to, you know, kiss something, you know, you get three days. Uh, you know, was it just the extreme language that he used? Uh, I know somebody who had jury duty this week and somebody who was in the, you know, the large jury pool refused to put a mask on. And apparently they talked to him and then just escorted him out of the building. Right. Now, to me, he should have got a week. You know, yeah, so I, <laughs> I think, you know, maybe a week's a little long, Alvin, but if, if I was a judge, I'd want to know that you don't come in and curse at me because you don't like my decision. Uh, was it why did they cussed out the, the legislative committee, uh, turned on the gripe and stuff? What attorney was that? Uh, was that Al Watkins? Oh, well, I, I, I don't know. It sounds like you know, it's not yeah, good. I think you know, nothing happened that's to like him. System. I agree with Alvin that it seemed a little much a week. I mean, a little shock time for 24 hours or something. But I think you make a case for maybe there needs to be sentencing guidelines for curse words. You know, it's like have a scale. <laughs> you know, like a scale. George Carlin's seven dirty words gets a certain... Well, I, I, re I remember uh, being in court when a, a defendant said to the judge, you're a lying SOB. And, and the judge just ignored him and he said, you're a perf perfidious SOB. And the judge said, that's it, contempt of court, you're going to jail. And I asked the judge about it and he, he said, well, I ignored it the first time, but if I have to look up a word, that guy's going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think our justice system is is sacred. And, you know, you have these courthouse shootings you, you you do have to have that decorum, but they should have socked him with a fine as well. So much for freedom of speech in a courtroom. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for your opinions. Don't go away. In a moment, we're going to talk about making our area walkable and bikeable and how that might lead to more economic development. Cindy Mency of Trailnet and Sarah Arnosky of Greater St. Louis, Inc. will be joining our founders, Bill McClellan and Ray Hartman, on Donnybrook Next Up. Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS. Welcome to Next Up. We're joined tonight by Cindy Mentz of Trail Net and Sarah Arnosky of Greater St. Louis, Inc. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us, you're involved in the business of making St. Louis a biking and walkable region. Tell us how you're going about doing that. Great. Well, thanks, Ray. I'll get started. I'm uh, Cindy Mentz. I'm the CEO of TrailNet. And TrailNet, we're a 32-year-old organization in St. Louis, a bicycle pedestrian advocacy org. So TrailNet works to make the streets safer for people to walk, bike, and use transit as a way of life. And we have a really terrific partnership with Greater St. Louis, Inc. on trying to move uh, better infrastructure forward. So, Sarah? Great. Thanks, Cindy. Yep. Again, my name is Sarah Arnosky. I'm a vice president at Greater St. Louis, Inc. I believe you had uh, our CEO, Jason Hall, on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so happy to be here. And so as, as Cindy mentioned, we, you know, from our perspective of Greater St. Louis, Inc., which is an economic development civic organization, we recognize the value of having a bike and pedestrian friendly community and how that contributes to in many ways, but particularly its economic impact. And so um, really wanting to, to play an, a critical role and help get things moving forward to make sure that we are keeping up with our peer cities and making St. Louis one of the, the best biking communities and cities around the or regions, really, um, around the country. The city, you indicate you're 32. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was going to say, I, I, 
uh, uh, love to walk. I'm a walker. And when I was working downtown all the time, I would often go and walk along the river. There's a river trail just north of downtown. And I'd, I'd walk uh, down to Produce Row sometimes. And the problem with it is the flood wall generally separates the walker or the biker, there would be bicycles, from the river. And I would think to myself, here's this great resource, the river, and I'm on the river trail, but I can't see the river most of the time. I mean, it, how can we utilize our river a little bit better? Yeah, that's a really great question and something that, you know, one of the things Greater St. Louis Inc. has also partaken in is the design downtown St. Louis comprehensive plan. And so one of those key strategies that was identified was how do we re-engage and celebrate our connection to the river? And so you do have the greenway that goes along the river, but I totally hear you on there's a wall in some of the in, that does block the view and the, the connection to the river. So I know that we've there's been a lot of different um, opportunities. I know that Cindy at Trailnet they help collect uh, folks to go on river rides. I don't know if Cindy you want to speak to that as well. Well, sure. I just want to acknowledge the Riverfront Trail is a trail that Trailnet um, established um, in partnership with the city of St. Louis many years ago. Um, so that's a legacy project of ours. Um, and it does need, it needs care and attention so that people continue to use it and feel safe um, in that area. And it, it does continue to be a bit of a challenge. Um, when the Riverfront was redone, we do have some really great infrastructure that GRG put in along Lewis K. Sullivan uh, Drive. So uh, that certainly has, has helped with that connection. For those that don't follow your work, how much is it? which is too many people that don't really keep up with everything that's going on. Um, how much different is St. Louis today than in 1989 when TrailNet was founded? What, what have, can you point to or what have we yeah. done to develop over that period? Sure. So um, St. Louis has really changed over the years. Um, one thing that we know is that uh, population-wise that this city was built for about a million people. And as we lose population, we still have these roadways, these big wide roadways um, where the streetcars used to be. So you've got streets that are 40 and 50 feet wide um, that are actually connecting just neighborhoods. And so we have this great street grid that also can be, um, the, the street could be, grid could be used in a way to make more room for pedestrians and cyclists to feel safer on the roadway. So we're maintaining a lot of roadway and there's room to add in infrastructure that would make it safer for people walking and biking. Um, so the changes that have happened over the years is we used to be happy with just a painted bike lane on the road or some sharrows, but um, the National Association of Transportation Officials have upgraded the type of infrastructure that is going to keep people safest. And so now what we're looking for are what we call protected bikeways or cycle tracks. And so that was, uh, that's a project that uh, together with Greater St. Louis Inc. Um, Trailnet helped promote this Tower Grove connector. And you're going to see some of the best infrastructure in St. Louis for keeping folks safe while walking and biking where they're physically separated from traffic. Um, and so those are the kinds of infrastructure now that we're seeing more and more of. There's one plan for 20th Street. There's one plan for Tucker Boulevard. Both of those are funded as well as Tower Grove, um, the Tower Grove connector. Um, so we're starting to see a shift in that direction. Maybe you live by Union Boulevard. The city has put in a protected bikeway and they're testing out some new infrastructure. Um, these things are called armadillos that they're these, um, these rubber protectors that are in the street, they're these mounds that would keep cars from going into the bike lane. So it used to be enough just to have, have room for a, a bike, but now with the size of cars and distracted driving, what people really are desiring is more protected infrastructure. And it's just really exciting to see an organization like Greater St. Louis Inc. embrace um, this type of infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, we've loved, you know, thinking about the neighborhood that the NGA is going to. 20th Street is a direct route up to that. So those new jobs that are going to be at the NGA, but also how that's going to spur economic development along 20th Street. We've seen that in a lot of other communities where you're creating this amenity that is exciting for people that already live there, but also attracts 
new residents and employees, which then attracts employers, which then attracts investment and more um, tax revenue, you know, to really just, it's a cyclical process that really does have multiple benefits in addition to creating a safe route to get from point A to point B. And um, Ray, most of these connections are connecting north and south into areas of strength. So St. Louis tends to be an east-west city, right? Our best connections you're going to see going east to west. And so a lot of times north and south is cut out. And so being able to have this type of infrastructure to connect people into areas of strength, connect them into transit, um, can really be a game changer. So will you be like running bike paths to like where the NGA is? Is that what you're saying? Or 20th Street has What's that? 20th Street has been funded. 20th um, Street, how far north does it go? Um, it will reach the NGA. Um, okay. Parnell and Jefferson. And yeah. they'll go to 20th Street. And um, primarily it'll be a protected cycle track, um, but there's their their right. design still needs to happen. And, and how far south? Is we need to meet with the community to find out more about what their needs are. And how about south? The same way as it have you determine how, how it'll be uh, to Union Station. Okay. Yeah, so that'll be a nice connection into the other major greenway infrastructure project with the Brickline Greenway. Um, so really thinking, as as Cindy mentioned, how are we knitting neighborhoods north and south and being in close partnership with the folks over at Great Rivers Greenway to make sure that these all complement each other and create a broader mobility network throughout the city. Hey, to, to go a little further afield, there's the Katy Trail, which I I like the Katy Trail immensely, and I've walked on it a long way. But do we have a way for like bicyclists to get from St. Louis to the Katy Trail e easily? And like I say, I'm not a bike bicyclist, but you know, for a bicyclist to get to the Katy Trail and zip down to Defiance or Herman, it just sounds like a great outing. And I don't know how easy it is to get from the city to the Katy Trail on a bicycle. That is a good question, Bill. I mean, obviously, if you start in St. Charles, uh, where the trail, where you can pick up. Right, right. Well, that's where I start walking. But but I drive to St. Charles and friends who are cyclists. How how would you bicycle there? Personally, I've taken the bus out to Chesterfield and then hopped on to the trail in Chesterfield to get there. Um, but you're right, it could certainly be be prioritized. Some people will use um, use the train and they'll take the train to um, to Washington, Missouri, and then try and get to the trail from there if folks don't want to get in a car. How have you done it, Sarah? I would say, yeah, there's unfortunately not a great direct cycling or, or pedestrian route from you know the city itself. But I think you bring up a good point with the Katy Trail and just such what a wonderful asset it is for the region. And we do know like on, you know, just speaking with site selectors, everything from like the Katy Trail down to these protected bikeways are just really important assets. So I think being able, especially as you're mentioning, linking them together would be a great future project. How do you decide where to put these? In other words, is it, you talk about the importance of economic development, which is great, that these, is it sort of a chicken and an egg question? Do you look for places that have economic develop, development to support and, and cover, such as like, for example, when the NGA is built, you would obviously have a place to go to, or is it, does it go in the other direction where you just decide where it needs to go and hope uh, that development uh, springs up around it? Ray, it really began, um, so Trailnet began this effort in 2016. We launched this bold vision for how do we connect St. Louis for, uh, for better and safer walking and biking. The plan was called Connecting St. Louis. It wasn't funded by anyone except Trailnet members um, and just through, through Trailnet general fundraising to do this project. And we were able to put the people um, put the people's ideas first. We worked with the city of St. Louis. We had eight different departments from the city of St. Louis uh, joining us. Um, Jason Hall joined us on one of our committees as well, Great Rivers Greenway. Um, some of the universities joined us. Uh, we didn't have any business interests in this. It was really just organizations looking at what kind of infrastructure do we need and where do people need to connect for access to, um, tr to transit and to opportunities. Uh, we had over 4,000 respondents to help us sort through where are these opportunity streets and where do they exist. And so 
through that process, it took us about two years. Um, several projects, several streets came forward. We have about 12, 12 miles of connections that we um, proposed. And um, that's where uh, our partners like Greater St. Louis Inc. came in and said, you know what, this connection here to Tower Grove Park is something that appealed to them. Um, so I can let Sarah talk more about that, but currently we have about 40% of the routes that we proposed either funded for federal construction or they're able to be taken up by entities who would be able to build them. So uh, the city of St. Louis might be leading the effort, for instance, on 20th Street and Great Rivers Greenway, um, adopting um, a connection um, up to Fairgrounds Park as well. So it's really uh, an idea that's resonating. Yeah, perfect. So speaking specifically to the Tower Grove connector, so again, that's a 1.4 mile protected bike lane from Tower Grove Park all the way up to the Grove. So when you ask the question, you know, is it about economic development, is it about need, and this was actually a really wonderful route because it already is in one of the most traveled bike routes in the city. A lot of folks are using that to get up to their jobs up at BJC campus or to Cortex. And so you kind of already had a good level of traffic happening in it. So people wanted to see an even better uh, infrastructure in place. But then what we also loved about this route is that you're connecting Tower Grove Park, the Botanical Garden, all of the new little shops that are popping up on the Botanical Heights. You have Indo and uh, Patisserie Choquette and Union Loafers and this like brand new ice cream, uh, ice cream sandwich place, all in this little intersection. And then when you go further north up along Vannevenner, it's just ripe with potential. You already have Rockwell Brewery that's right there. And then there's all these other ideas for development that when you add something like a cycle track to it, it just gets people even more excited and want that they want to invest and be a part of this momentum that's happening. And the research shows that they spend more money. So people on bikes stop more frequently they, and they spend more money because they're stopping more frequently. Um, and getting to know things on a human scale. So they'll see, you know, what's on sale at the patisserie because they're moving slowly enough to see all of that as they go through. You know, it's several years ago, there were competing bicycle rental places where you'd see these bikes laying around all the time. I mean, one was lime green and another was something else. And I thought, well, this is kind of exciting, more people bicycling. and all of a sudden they were gone. What, what happened to that? I miss those bikes, but go ahead, Cindy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I've always heard really great things when people saw the bike share bikes, even the crabby people who are like, you bike people um, were excited about the, the those bike share bikes. And um, what seemed to happen was is it laid the groundwork for um, the scooters, which are easier for the companies to to place, they can put more of the scooters out and you don't have to be able to ride a bike. Um, some more dense cities are seeing electric bikes as part of the um, the asset, the, the resources that are coming to their cities. St. Louis yet hasn't been on that list to get electric bikes included as, um, as part of the offerings. So I'm sure you saw the scooters coming back on the streets and scooters, you know, we call them bike lanes, but these lanes, they're multi-use lanes for people um, in using motorized um, devices like wheelchairs and also for um, for scooters. Um, so the bikes, I think that they became just too expensive um, for the companies to keep up and they could make more money on the scooters. Are, are the bicycles working anywhere? I mean, the rental bikes, it seemed like it was such a growing <laughs> thing. Well, in Indianapolis, they're working great around the Indianapolis Cultural Trail. Um, they're still using them in uh, in Kansas City. Um, Bike Walk KC, who's similar to TrailNet, um, they actually run it with um, some some federal uh, support for funding for doing that. Um, you're going to see them in D.C. and Chicago. In D.C., you're going to see like you well, have well, one car that's going to take. Why can't we store. have that here? Why can't we have nice things? <laughs> I think Bill well, wants to rent a bike. Yeah, wow. I mean, having having a smooth transition from from using transit to be able to use a scooter or a bike, um, 
I don't want to speak for CMT, but I know they're not, I, I mean, for Metro Transit, I know they're not against it and that those are uh, certainly advances that will make the system um, easier for that last mile connection. And I think the other piece too is just as we build out the bike network and we get more cyclists out there, there's all, the, you know, a lot of people that do bike a lot in St. Louis will tell you there's a lot of opportunities for conflicts with cars. And so it really is something that just needs to be more normalized, um, for lack of a better term, for just people riding bikes around so that we, we can have nice things and then people uh, <laughs> take care of them and then they continue to, to use them. You mentioned Jason Hall earlier, who of course is the uh, CEO of Greater St. Louis Inc. I assume when he was taking part in this, that was part of Arch to Park, correct? Uh, Correct. Yep. So I have worked yeah. under Jason at Arch to Park, and we helped kind of kick off this project and then carry it forward with Greater St. Louis. Something Inc. that the private sector at Arch to Park is investing in, or is it more of a, a community? I mean, in other words, I don't know how much investment is involved in building these, and whether the private sector is involved or the public or both in making decisions to where to invest in these trails and and so forth. Yeah. No. Great question. So. Um, because this project initially launched um, with this part with your excuse me with applying for federal grant money, so this is very much a private public partnership. Um, so this particular stretch, this Tower Grove connector, does have a five point six million dollar federal grant that is going towards construction. But we had, as Arch to Park and now Greater St. Louis Sink, have also committed um, to funding for the private match in addition to the application process, in addition to the engineering and design phase of this project. So, you know, we are one of many partners that are that are participating in the project, but we are one of the lead funders to make it happen. Because again, we recognize how important it is um, for our region to grow to have these kinds of amenities. How, can I say, how much is that investment? Is it? Um, all in, it's I, I'm, I don't have it in front of you, but I think it's about 2.6 million. From the prior, so. from just from March to Park or Greater St. Louis? Correct. I guess it, okay. And I just want to say that early on when Arch to Park embraced this project, um, they paid for an engineering study to just make us ready to apply for the funds mm -hmm. through the city. Mm -hmm. So the city of St. Louis has been a great partner working through this. And we've had aldermen who have dedicated some of their funding uh, toward getting this done. And so many partners have come together to, to really make this a success. Yeah, and just to reiterate, the, yeah, the city of St. Louis, I mean, that's how we, they're the main partner on this because we can't apply for funds from the federal government without the partnership of the city. And so, you know, they really have been advocates in wanting to see these kinds of projects move forward all throughout. Do you think we have more hostility from drivers toward bicycles in this city than in most cities? I mean, you know, because whenever there's a conversation about bicyclists, some grumpy old guy usually will say, oh, those bicyclists, you know, they're on Clayton Road, taking up an entire lane. And if you say, well, sure, we have to share the road, people get upset and, and complain about bicyclists. Is, is that common everywhere or is that more prevalent here? Should we emphasize we are not the grumpy old guys? I want to emphasize. just sort of channeling. You're not even an old guy, old right? Guys. Still a young guy. It just, just, yeah. Well, I think you're kind of sorting out two things. I, uh, the, uh, what, the activity you see on Clayton Road, that's awfully often on the weekends, right? That yes. We, you might see larger groups of folks recreating and well, sometimes you'll just see uh, two miles. people and and they'll be riding along in the right hand lane but but not single file you know so people do have to go around them i mean i'm you know, you know, i'm not impatient but many people are yeah. two yeah. people side by side probably take less room than an suv but um, oh, absolutely <laughs> but they go much slower than an suv yeah, I, I would say I'm a I'm a bike commuter, so I live in your neighborhood, Bill, and I bike to downtown St. Louis. And um, I would say over the last seven years and biking to work, maybe two or three times, I might have been yelled at and told to get on the side. That's not so bad. I mean, <laughs> but not by Bill. Bill. Maybe. Not, not by Bill. That's not that bad. I don't think it was Bill. Um, okay. That's and, good. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. He's more likely to say, get off my lawn. Not, <laughs> not, not, not. We do, uh, 
at TrailNet, we also work on policy, and so we help to establish an anti-harassment policy so that cyclists cannot be harassed, that somebody can be prosecuted for harassing a cyclist, really? you know, throwing a piece of pizza at them. Oh, oh. Happened to one of my interns. Really? Um, but we did establish that because uh, we want people to feel safe using transit, walking, biking, using other forms of transit and uh, transportation and not being discriminated against. Um, women find that a lot, um, that, that they can be um, uh, a target um, while they're walking or biking. Um, and so we helped establish that, that policy uh, in St. Louis. Well, well, Cindy, if you're a neighbor of mine, I take it that you, you bicycle a lot in Forest Park? Absolutely. Right. I mean, what a great place that is. And part of that is that it's protected too, right? So both Forest Park has protected lanes and these, this new one with Tower Grove connectors protected to help reduce some of those conflicts with cars. But I, the other piece that's kind of exciting about some of these new infrastructure projects is not only is it better for bikes and pets, it's gonna be better for cars too, because we're also upgrading some of the signals so that you're no longer sitting at red lights every time you hit a light, but they're actually gonna be coordinated to, to help with the flow of traffic and to reduce any idling to help improve that air quality as well. So I think, you know, we, while we focus a lot on the bike pet, it actually does have improvements for cars as well. Okay. And it's such, such wonderful work. Do you have a way to, to quantify the impact you're having? I mean, I don't know how you measure how many people are cycling. Is there a, is there a way to do that that could say, gee, we've got this many more cyclists than we did well, actually, uh, uh, so how, how do you how do you measure success? I guess is my question. Well, there's a variety of ways that we measure it. One of them is applying to become a bike friendly city, mm -hmm. and St. Louis has a silver level. They moved up from bronze, um, and working toward a gold level recognition or platinum. Um, we also uh, Trailnet hosts each year. We do um, a bike count uh, and a bike ped count in September. So we'll spend two days out there counting people walking and biking at various locations. We secure a bunch of volunteers and you'll see us out there with our clipboards looking nosy and, and counting people walking and biking so that we can get a better indication of, of with our own data of how um, traveled these areas are. And then we can also compare it to crash data. So we, we also have a lot of crash data on where are we seeing more crashes um, that are fatal for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, to help the city prioritize where they they put in improvements. Okay. Hey, Sarah, a minute ago, you, you mentioned something about uh, traffic lights, you know, that they're being timed better or something. Where do, where do you stand on bicyclists who come up to a red light and look and make sure nobody's coming, but, but then cross? I mean, I look at it and I think that's probably a safe thing to do, but a lot of people say, those darn cyclists, they don't pay attention to the rules of the road. Where are you on that? So it's funny because so we had a public open house on the Tower Grove connector yesterday, and I had a, a, a gentleman come in who's an avid cyclist, and he was very adamant that it was important for cyclists to follow all traffic rules because as soon as people start breaking them, that's when accidents happen, that's when people get upset. Um, so, you know, I mean, it really is best practice to follow traffic rules, even if it does look clear. You know, but I have, do I follow that every time? I'm not, you know. <laughs> there is a, actually, there is a the bike, the statute for bikes, bicyclists is that you can stop for a dead, if the red light isn't registering you as a cyclist. So it's kind of a fuzzy area, but let's oh, say it's, it's one of those lights that is only, it only detects cars and the light doesn't turn like at Jefferson and, um, and Locust it won't register you as a cyclist, so you won't get the light. And so there is a law that um, cyclists can go through a dead red by coming to a stop. If the red light doesn't recognize them, they can go through it. So, um, yeah, so now we know. Yeah, it is, it is legal if it's not <laughs> registering you, so. And well, well, I can see where it's even a safe thing to do sometimes. I see a bicyclist come up and, you know, and he or she knows that in a few minutes somebody might be coming down, but right now it's clear. But the driver sitting there next to them or her. Well, if, they, if a driver was there with the cyclist, that doesn't qualify. So what I'm saying is that if a cyclist... No, I, I, I understand. I, I understand what you're saying. I, 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 we're out of time. 
We're running out of time. Right, real quickly, in like 10, where can people find these rules of the road? Just can you tell us in about 10 seconds? Well, you absolutely can find them on TrailNet's website at trailnet.org. All the rules of cycling? Yes. Answer some of Bill's questions. And we want to thank you, uh, Sarah Arnosky of Greater St. Louis, Inc., and Cindy Mintz of TrailNet for doing such a great job of tolerating our questions. You're welcome back anytime on Next Stop. Thank you again uh, for your insight. We appreciate it. And to our Donnybrook audience, we will see you again next Thursday night. Oh, we hope to see you on the Moonlight Ramble, August 21st. We'll be oh, in Tower Grove. That's a great thing. All right, thank you. Bye. Donnybrook is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.